Father, we thank you, we praise you. Oh Lord, we thank you for your grace and your mercy that exalts the name of Jesus Christ in our midst. Father, we declare that the dominion that belongs to Jesus reign and rule in our hearts all the time. And for every single one who comes and steps into this area, Lord, even into the surrounding areas, that the light and the dominion of Jesus will shine forth and cause the rule and reign of Jesus to be perfected over each life. We thank you, Lord, that your grace and your mercy continue to abound fresh every morning, every day. Father, we declare your goodness to our lives, how good you have been. And when we look at all the past and all the present and all the future, we truly can declare you have been a good God. A God who has watched over your word to fulfill it and to bring it to pass. A God who is the author and finisher of our faith. So that everything that we desire, everything that we dream, everything that we visualize that is in line with your word, you have always brought it to pass. And we ask, O God, that you would establish faith healing, health, abundance, prosperity, and divine life into each one of our spirits, souls, and bodies as we look into your word. Thank you, O God, for speaking to us the rhema that we all need to hear. Let your word go forth like a two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. And Father, we covenant with you that we will always seek to glorify, honor, and worship the name that is above every name, and that is the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. For in you, O Lord, we live and move and have our being. Thank you, Father God. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. We have been looking at mega church principles, so far we have covered three. Let me revise to you. Principle 31 is what I call true perspective. Principle number 32 is entitled time frame. In a mega church, we don't always get the perspective even if you're involved in just one department or one ministry. And we need to be able to project ourselves out of what we are doing to see the full perspective. And time frame, because in a mega church, change takes time. Because there are more people to change. And more departments and things that we need to restructure when you go in a new direction. Therefore, patience and long-suffering is necessary when you're in leadership role in a mega church. There is no room for impatience. Change, when you move one, one million people, for example, it takes a longer time to change. And we have talked in detail on that, so I won't repeat. It's different when you're moving ten people. The third point which we have been struggling to find a right title, we know what the key is, we know what the principle is, we have taught on that on multiple personality, and how that we have to have a certain type of personality that can accept people who are opposite from us. To accept personalities that we normally would not like to work with or we relate with. You can do that in a small group. Choose and work with people who are like in nature, character and upbringing with you. But when you work in a mega church, you must be prepared to work with people who can be diametrically opposed to you in personality. And unless our personality enlarges to encompass and receive people like that, we will never grow big. Something has to grow big in our, in our inside. And I call that, now I found the right title for it. It's called Principle 33, Mega Personality. A Mega Personality. 
is opposed to a micro personality. Micro personality are people who can only relate to some people. A mega personality is someone who can relate to more people, who can adapt to more people and put up with their idiosyncrasies. And uh, this morning we hope to touch on uh, uh, principle 34 and 35. Principle 34 and 35. Let's look in the Old Testament, first of all, on uh, principle 34. Uh, we're going to give it in the exact order that we have here, and uh, that's why I don't preach from notes, but I'm trying to give a uh, systematic order in which we are ministering in uh, 40 principles how we run the church. In the book of 1 Samuel, we're going to look at the life of David and the progression of his life and ministry. Let's look at chapter 16 of 1 Samuel. And as we look at principle number 34, I call that limited contact. Limited contact. Because we are all human beings redeemed by the grace and the blood of Jesus Christ, we have only 24 hours per person. And have you noticed that as you grow in life and you mature in life, that you have more things to do but your time remains the same. And the more you grow, the more you expand, you, the, more, the, the more things you have with the same amount of time. The time doesn't grow. It remains 24 hours for every one of us. So there is a limit in which how a physical person can contact another person. Can contact in a personal way, can contact in an intimate way, and can contact in a, in a more closely close manner. Even Jesus, he had the multitude, he had the 70 disciples, he had his 12 apostles, and then he has the three inner circle. We have to recognize that. Only God who is omnipresent, who can be present in more than, more than uh, one place at any one time, has the ability to contact every single one of us intimately. And at all times, anyone on this planet Earth, whether they are in the North Pole, South Pole, Equatorial area, they will be able to relate in an intimate way with God, and God will be able in His divine way to give them a full attention, while somewhere on another part of this globe, another person is having an intimate relationship with God. When God came in the form of Jesus Christ to this planet Earth, He became limited in a physical expression. And so Jesus followed what I call the limited context, in which He relates to the three, to the twelve, to the seventy, and then to the multitude. Limited contact means that you can tell whether someone can work in a mega church or not, but the desire for contact. As the church grow and as the organization grow, people who always say, oh, I always want you to be here, I always want you to be here, and uh, will not have mega personalities. They, they have no ability to function independently. They will never rise up in mega church leadership. You see, in mega church structure, we may contact, for example, departmental ministry leaders once or twice a year, and that's all. And a person must have an ability to do well the rest of the time without contact. And the less we are able to do it, for example, if, if we have to employ a manager, and the manager needs to be with me five days a week to show him how to do something, to suggest ideas to him, then I ask myself the question, why do I need him? I must well do the job. And so people with that kind of personality are not fit for mega church. They are only fit in small circles. Mega church personalities are like chief CEOs. And every department and ministry becomes like a sub-CEO branch or company one company or one branch of a company and their CEO over there. You look at the way 
Big organizations are run. It's not for the sake of hierarchy or for stepping over people's heads. But it's just for the sake of being able to perform and get the job done. The only way to get a big job done is to get independent people. Not people who will constantly call up and say, oh, I want you here, I cannot do it. And I will turn around and say, look, we didn't employ you as a club. We employ you as a manager. A club cannot make decisions. A club cannot quite uh, have much authority to think through some things and have a, a limited authority to act without consultation. But a manager has. And that's why a mega personality must be followed by an understanding of principle 34 that there is a limited contact when we begin to work in a mega church. And so people who work in a mega church and who desire, oh, uh, Pastor Peter, I, I need you to be ready seven days a week. And say, look, if I have to be you, be you seven days a week, I must not do the job. And the reason why you are there is because God called you to be there. And uh, you should be able to do the job with limited contact. Which means that we could be on a phone line in all emergencies and consultations. Physical contact face to face becomes limited in a mega church. And we must live with the reality. We must not complain. We must live with the reality. Small thinking group. People keep thinking, oh, you know, they, they keep trying to run a 2,000 member church with a 200 member personality. Look, that is wrong. We have to accept that principles differ when you grow. And we run things differently. And uh, if people come, oh, it has never been like this all the time. Oh, we used to have all these things. Of course we used to. That was when we were 200. I remember when the church was going, we were about 200, 300 people. We used, uh, almost seven days a week we would be doing things. And in fact, the church office started in my house. I lit the stamps and placed it on the envelope. We don't even have a full-time worker. We don't even have clerical staff. We started that way. We lit the stamps, praise the Lord. We asked the saliva and we placed it on the letters. All the welcome letters, we stand it out. And we started with one, in two, and then it grows. And I remember every week we would visit different homes. But when the church grows, we say, look, if I keep visiting homes, I don't have time to attend to building projects. I don't have time to attend to departmental organization. I don't have time to travel and do convention. Because there are now too many homes. And so we have to recognize that structural changes come as the church grows. My philosophy is like this, I used to tell people. When it comes to doing work, I believe that we have to do it professionally. We expect top class work. We don't, we don't want second grade work. When we do any work for God, we want to do it professionally. However, when it comes to fellowship, we can be chinjai simple. I don't mind sitting on the floor wearing our informal clothes and sports shorts and eating peanuts with you. Doesn't matter we even have the peanuts or not. We don't mind. When it comes to fellowship, you'll find that we can come down to that level. And that's important. Our basic simplicity hasn't changed. And all you have to do, I mean, we, we still, no one's in a while take turns and we go for lunch and we fellowship and still visit. People think I'm not visiting, I am. Except there are so many, it takes a long time before it comes to you. <laughs> we still visit people, we still have urgent calls, we still go to hospitals. We still do that. Except when there's more, you don't realize it's been done. Because in comparison to the percentage of, of the amount of people, that is not so visible now. And you're still limited to a physical body that acts only over 24 hours. Only uh, unipresent. When it comes to fellowship, it's to me, is to use a local expression, Chin Chai. It means anything goes. Simplicity. We don't, we don't mind anything. You know, when we visit, visit your house, it doesn't matter whether, you know, the sofa is done properly, whether the children's diapers all over the place, and, 
It's okay. You don't mind sitting on the floor. You don't mind you know, sharing uh, your Milo Tare. You know? It's uh, because I don't drink tea, right? <laughs> and, uh, or, or anything. It's, it's kin chai. I'm very simple when it comes to fellowship. I'm still the same person, remember. I have only measured and grown in different ways. Basically, when it comes to one-to-one relationship, it's still the same. And then when it comes to doing work, we don't want any chin chai thing. We want professional work. So the two are, are completely matured on both sides. On one side, when it comes to work, I do it professionally. When it comes to fellowship, I go all the way with anything else. Simplicity. Now let's look at First Samuel chapter 16. How David's ministry grew and how he began to have less and less contact with his people. I want to show how limited contact comes about. First Samuel 16. David has what I call a private anointing. There's always two anointings you receive, a private anointing and a public anointing. In First Samuel 16 verse 13, Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel arose and went to Ramah. That's a private anointing. Nobody was, a, was around except some of the close people. Maybe his family members and maybe some of the key people in the city. After that, David was not crowned king. He was an anointed king. The private anointing is the call that God has on your life, which the world doesn't know yet, which the world doesn't recognize. To the world, who is David? He is a shepherd boy, son of Jesse, younger son of Jesse, a little shepherd boy. To the world, he's still a shepherd boy, but in God's eyes, he is a king. To the world, you may just be a clerk, but in God's eyes, you may be a budding evangelist. To the world, you may be a housewife, in God's eyes, you may be called as an evangelist. There's a private anointing. You could feel it burning in your bones. But the public anointing took time to come. Between the private and the public were opportunities God gave David. First opportunity that came was to serve as a musician. In chapter 16, verse 16, Let our master now command your servants who are before you to seek out a man who is a skillful player on the harp, and it shall be that he will play it with his hand when the distressing spirit from God is upon you, and you shall be well. And the person selected was David. He came in verse 23, Whenever the Spirit, allowed by God, came upon Saul, David would take a harp and play it with his hand. He was anointed to be king by his function as a musician, because that was the only door open to him. He was not famous yet, nobody knew him, nobody knew the anointing on his life. What was David? He was faithful. Faithful. If we cannot be faithful to whatever little open door God gives us, don't expect more. David was faithful as a musician. Chapter 17. Now, meanwhile, some people are called to great things, but because they sidestep the doors that God opened, they never move to great things. Paul was called to be an apostle, but all Barnabas did in Acts 11 was calling to help out in the church. If, if, if Paul said, well, I don't think that's my line, I'm called to the Gentiles' missionary work, and refused that call, he may have closed the door on himself. I wonder how many people close doors on themselves, because the door got opened didn't look like the door they're expecting. What kind of door are they expecting? They're expecting a huge, big door, with gold door knobs, and a silver lining, and a huge arc, Roman arc, uh, a door that's about 8 feet high, and uh, two feet wide, and uh, they are looking for that door because they know that's the door God called them to be. However, the first door that got opened looks like a little door of a dog canal, about two feet high, and uh, two feet wide, 
The only way you can go in is to bend on your knees and crawl. A very humbling experience. And you say, no way, that couldn't be the door. God, this doesn't look like the door. The vision I saw was Roman archer silver lining, golden door now. And look at this. It doesn't even have a handle. All there is is a big hole. Two feet by two feet. And, and this is the door you open. But that's the door got open because if you were crawl to that, through that door on your knees, learning humility, suddenly you see beyond that little door is the door that God opened for you. Chapter 17 was the turning point in David's life. But as you see, we learn humility, we learn the weapons in our life, we learn and we become equipped in small little things. He that is not faithful in little things will not be given much. The process of us being equipped is as important as the position that God brings to our life. So don't underestimate what I call the process. Many people wish to be millionaires, but they want it instantly. And sometimes some people are even buying the social lottery, putting it between their Bibles. And praying every day, oh God, <laughs> praise the Lord. <laughs> it never works. Now I know some people, out of the statistic of millions of people, sure in one case somebody may get something, but that doesn't prove that it's God. <laughs> the experience of working hard and believing God for the million dollars is as important as a million dollars. Hello there. Don't underestimate that process. The experience of reaching that door is as important as the door. Because if you don't have the experience in reaching that door, when you reach that door, you may not handle that door. I mean, you, you, you somehow or other, you took a shortcut. I don't know how you did it. You go around the dock canal. And you reach a huge door. But, because you didn't go through much effort, you had no strength to push that door. But the effort that you would have made earlier, going step by step, would strengthen your muscles to do it. The spiritual muscles, that is. David says in verse 37, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, He will deliver me from the paw of the Philistine. No, the hand of the Philistine. Just checking whether you're awake. <laughs> From the hand of the Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go and the Lord be with you. Now David had to have experiences with the lion and the bear. Things that don't look like the doors got open. But it's those experiences that equip him for the finale, which is Goliath. After that, a different door opened for David. In chapter 18, in chapter 18, verse 13. Therefore Saul removed him from his presence and made him his captain over a thousand. And he went out and came in before the people. Now over how many people was David? Over one thousand. He said, but I'm king over the millions of people. Wait, if you're not faithful to your hundred sheep as a shepherd, you cannot even move to a thousand people. Now David was progressing. Now he has moved on to a thousand people under his leadership. And he did well. He was a captain over them. In verse 14, David behaved wisely in all his ways and the Lord was with him. However, Saul was afraid of him. Then we know that David was driven from the presence of Saul and in chapter 22, have you found it in chapter 22? 1 Samuel 22, verse 1. David therefore departed from there and escaped to the cave of Adullam. And when his brothers and all his father's house heard it, they went down there to him. And everyone who was in distress, and everyone who was in debt, and everyone who was discontented gathered to him. So he became captain over them, and there were about 400 men with him. Now he only counts the men. We don't know how many women they were. We know that the, some of the men were married, 
Because in this land, remember, their wives and their children were taken. You know what my guess is? He had a thousand people. He had a thousand people. It, it didn't include his father, his brethren, etc. The 400 men were the 400 men in his, in his little private army. Let me tell you, if you have an anointing to minister to 500 people, you can be placed anywhere on this planet or you will have 500 people. If you have an anointing for 1,000, no matter how you're persecuted, you will see a track at 1,000. No matter where you are, no matter how you're placed, it's the anointing that breaks the yoke. It's the gift of God that draws the people. It's not human effort, it's not organization. It's the gift of God that we must recognize. That draws the people. Which is why, if you're called of God, you're chosen of God, and you're anointed of God, you don't have to fret or worry about wherever you are in the world. Because the gift will make room for you. Where there's no room, the gift will make room for you. He has 400 foot soldiers. Not counting his family who came to be with him. Not counting their wives and their children. My estimate is about 1,000 people. He only shifted organization. He never lost his anointing. Now, he was still at that level because he has to be tested in his faithfulness at that level. Now constantly Saul came after him and he had many opportunities to come against Saul and kill him and hasten the process of his kingship. But he did not. Now we see that among the 400, David began to raise up what you call key leaders. And in chapter 30, you have the story of Ziklag, chapter 30, verse 10, verse 9 and 10. Have you found it? Second, uh, first Samuel 30, verse 9 and 10. So David went, we are only interested in the, in the figures, that's why I'm just running through. Verse 9 and 10. So David went, he and the 600 men who were with him, and came to the brook of Bistor, where those stayed who were behind. But David pursued he and 400 men, for 200 stayed behind. David pursued he and 400 men, who were so weary that they could not cross the brook Bistor. Now here it says that David has grown. His army at Ziklag was now 600 men. And as they came to the little town of Ziklag, possibly now, remember he has a whole, whole if I can call it, whole little town to himself. How big is a town? Five people? Of course not. He had a little city called Ziklag which was given to him by the Philistines when he allied himself to them. Uh, 1 Samuel 30 verse 9 10. So David went, we are only interested in the, in the figures, that's why I'm just running through. Verse 9 10. So David went, he and the 600 men who were with him, and came to the brook of Bistor, where those stayed who were behind. But David pursued he and 400 men, for 200 stayed behind. David pursued he and 400 men, who were so weary that they could not cross the brook Bistor. Now here it says that David has grown. His army at Ziklag was now 600 men. And as they came to the little town of Ziklag, Possibly now. Remember he has a whole, whole, if I can call it, whole little town to himself. How big is a town? Five people? Of course not. He had a little city called Ziklag which was given to him by the Philistines when he allied himself to them. He had 600 trained foot soldiers. By now he possibly may have about two, three thousand people. Not counting the other young, young teenagers, the little children, the wives, and the unmarried daughters. And the elderly fathers of these people who may brought their family too. Just like David's family was with him. So he had 600 foot soldiers. And we all know the story. How when he split them into two groups, 400 went on. 
to get back everything and 200 left behind and how the how among the 200 David by that time had already lost some contact with the people the moment a group begins to grow beyond the 300 mark that's why you find in the world although there are huge and famous mega churches you read about all the time in newsletters but 90, 90% of all churches in the planet earth are only in the region of about two, three hundred people. You read it in the news and don't have the impression that the whole world, all the churches are mega churches. The mega churches are more famous, but 90% of all the churches on the planet Earth are around that figure because to break the 300 mark, it takes a mega personality. You begin to lose contact with people and unless you know how to structure a system, and you know how to and I, I, I used to counsel we are helping other pastors break that mark there are pastors who are mentoring under us who we are helping them to break the mark and, and, and I advise these pastors all the time they ring me up when they have a structural situation we are setting up key churches not we but people who are called but they come under our umbrella and we are helping them to be the main church that changed their city and their town. And I used to tell them, when a church begins to reach about 300 plus people, the pulpit ministry becomes as important as the visitation ministry, if not more. There, become a, there is a point where it shifts over. When a church is just starting off with 10, 20, 50 people, visitation may take 80% of the pastor's time and pulpit ministry 20%. But the moment a church passes the 300 mark, the opposite must take place. The pastor must concentrate 80% of his effort on the pulpit ministry and 20% of visitation because he's losing contact with the people and the only contact he is is on Sunday. And if he can get the right message and get the right rhema, people who come will hear what God wants to tell them instead of sitting in the counseling room and having to hear it one by one. And he has to put more prayer in it. And pastors who refuse to do that will never excel. We have uh, six foundational principles for churches. And uh, it's a series that we did in Sabbath. One of those is the centrality of the pulpit ministry. And we need to understand that. So by this time, David's ministry has grown. But you can see that the fact that he has to be a rebellion in words. 20, 21, 22 onwards, shows that he's beginning to lose contact with them. Now what happens when you lose contact with the multitude? You have entrusted loyal leaders. That's why it becomes more important for you to delegate the authority and depend on people who are independent. Who knows how to do the job without constantly calling upon you. And we know that immediately after Ziklag, Saul died, Jonathan died in war. And then David was crowned king in Hebron by the tribe of Judah. And Benjamin tried to go along because they were inside the tribe of Judah. While the other ten tribes continued to be led by Abner, the son of Ner. With the figure here, Ishbosheth, Saul's son. David was crowned king only over two tribes. By that time, he became a leader over, I don't know what's the population. Maybe it's 500,000, maybe it's a million people. We do not know. We can guesstimate. But definitely, he is now in the hundreds of thousands. No more thousands, but hundreds of thousands when he was king over Hebron. Can you imagine that? At that level, you definitely lose contact. For example, we, we have good leaders in our nation. We have a good prime minister. Does any one of us in our country complain just because you haven't met him face to face? Of course not. You don't expect he is leader over, over 17 million Malaysians. We are one of the million. One of the 17 million. Do we complain? We don't complain. Because you know, I mean, 
unless you you are in some way in the in the structural work or in the parliamentary work or in the cabinet work, you won't have as often a chance to meet him. Because if he spent all his time meeting 17 million people one by one, by the time he meets half the people, it's time for the next election. And he wouldn't have done anything. So understand that I'm just giving a, 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 a high scenario so that when you look backwards, you see that somewhere between 50 people, the twos and threes and tens and twenties and hundreds, somewhere as you go up, there is a loss of contact. And the bigger you grow, the more it must be accepted and the leaders who work with you must accept that. If they don't accept that, they have small micro personality, they will never be fit to run a big sub-organization. That's why it's important to grow. As we grow externally, we must grow internally. Our personalities must grow along. We cannot remain the same. I like to turn over to the book of Chronicles. So let's turn over and see the growth of David's army and you begin to have an understanding of how he slowly lost contact and began to depend more and more on his mighty men. First Chronicles chapter twelve. Verse one. Well, maybe there's some portion in chapter eleven we better look at before we look at that. Chapter eleven of First Chronicles. Remember David had 400 mighty men, by Ziklag he had 600 mighty men. But he has to organize them so that he could contact them through his right arm, if I call it. His right and his left arm. Already with 600 people, not counting the women and the children, David will have lost contact, physical contact with the people. He has to have a structure by which the people can have access to him and he has access to them. Now one thing good, the way we have structured the church, is we have our leadership structure, but at any time, anybody can just call out and make an appointment to see me. They don't even have to go through the structure. Of course it may take time to get an appointment, but the thing is, it is there. And I will keep it there. It will always be kept there. So that people have free direct access and they can make use of the channel. But there is also what I call the ways in which we minister to the multitude, which is structure, in which we could reach to this everyone individually. We could love and care and nourish and, and take care of the sheep, protect them, love them, visit them in the hospitals when they are sick, help them when they are in need, help them when they lost a job. And be with them when they rejoice. Be with them when they cry. We have our structure in which we minister so that everyone will be ministered to. Hallelujah. And so that we feel the closeness that we have. And so we have the structure, we have the access. Which I believe is a structure in the Old Testament too. Now, in order to structure the care and nurture of these 400 men plus the others who were not soldiers, you see in verse 10. These were the head of the mighty men. And they were grouped into different groups who were very, very independent. Now, that is sub point one. In order to have limited contact, you must have independent people. Independent people who know how to work with just one word. I like people whom I can just meet once a year and say this is the vision, this is the direction. Between now and our next meeting, you can be on call to me. Anytime, 24 hours a day, my line is there on call. For anything we can chat over. But physical meeting is a different issue. And I like people who are so effective, they say thank you. I can understand your vision and I'll carry it through. The independent people who know how to work would know how to understand the vision. Now, we're not talking about just being in authority. When I work for an organization, let's say I become an ICFM uh, uh, Asian director, I don't need to keep asking the United States and say, please can you send someone to be with me here. I need them. No. In fact, I say, all you have to tell me is tell me what your vision is, the rest we will handle it. That's the way we handle things. I know how to also submit to authority. 
And then I know I haven't even made one a single phone call to the United States in order to ask them how to run the ICF van. All I need is your vision, your method, your limitations that you give me, and the liberty you give me. So they may give. Okay, these are our rules. These are what we want to do. We will prefer ICFM speakers and conventions rather than non-ICFM. I say, fine, I'll go along with that. If it's an ICFM conference, I will just put ICFM people. I don't even want to ask again. See, we must know how to work under authority, which I know. All you have to tell me is, if I were to come and work under any one of you, all I need is just one meeting with you, and I may not need to meet you again until there's a change of direction. That's how effective the Lord has helped me to be. And I expect people who are in mega churches to have that kind of ability. That is why dependent people will continue to have a place in a small ministry. But independent people will find a greater avenue as in a mega church. And that's number one with it, independent people. Not rebellious people, but independent people who know how to work independently and deal with the whole vision. And David had structured it so that he had the head of the mighty man. Whom David had, who strengthened themselves with him in his kingdom, with all Israel, to make him king according to the word of the Lord. Now here is the important principle. They were independent, but they were in relationship with him. Look at the A. They strengthen themselves with him. B. To make him king. They were not there to exalt themselves. They were there to help make him king. They knew what their vision was. They knew who their red Indian chief were. There can only be one red Indian chief. That's our first principle. C. According to the word of God. See, none of us are anything in ourselves. That is why our vision is a church where it doesn't matter whether you're rich or you're poor. It doesn't matter whether you're famous or infamous. It doesn't matter whether you're well-known in social circles or unknown. It doesn't matter what kind of home you live in. It can be a little squatter hut. It can be a, a, a big mansion. But when we come to the church, our encouragement is let us learn to be equal. Let's learn to put aside all these artificial things that the world put on earth. And learn that we are all just brothers and sisters in the Lord. Hallelujah. Some of you are going to go for your reunion. And when you do, and some of you may meet your brothers and sisters with their families and with their own jobs for the first time. You're not going to make a big issue if, if you are a doctor or if you are a doctor or if you are a, 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 a cabinet minister. Are you? You're not. They're going to sit together and say, Ah, you're my little brother who played marbles with me. We have to be that way, I say. When we partnership, we must learn how to be equal. Don't put on your front. And I believe the place where we take off our mask is in the church. Hallelujah. And be real. Be who God makes you to be. Remember, if we are all stripped of our wealth, we are all stripped of our titles, we are all stripped of our education, we are all stripped of our ability, we are all stripped of everything that we have, and we all look at each other, we are all the same. That's why we need to emphasize that. Now we thank God for anything that God has placed in your life. But it matures us when we learn an equality principle. And once we learn how to be equal, we learn how to work better when we are out in the world with unequal distribution of wealth. Inequal distribution of ability. Inequal distribution of things. We learn how to harmonize. So he has this division. And uh, all these famous people, verse 15. There were three of the 30 chief men. Now you all hear about the 30 mighty men, the 30 mighty men. The 30 mighty men were chief over all the other 600. They were captains over them. And of these 30, there was another three chief among the 30. So they had the understanding of the contact system. They we had limited contact with the foot soldier. I contact them to this mighty man. That was all we wanted to see. And there were groupings of three each. There were the mighty three, then there was another three, and then another three, different groups of three. 
team teamwork among them. Now chapter 12. Verse 1. Now these were the men who came to David at Ziklag while he was still a fugitive from Saul, the son of Kish, and they were among the mighty men helpers in the war. Now here he's talking about people who came to him while he was at Ziklag. At the end of, of his uh, fugitive years, almost towards the end, Ziklag was the last town he was before he became king. And there were a lot of people, mighty people, uh, verse 2, those famous for bows and arrows. Verse 3, the chief was a higher zer. So he had chief among them. And uh, verse 8, some Gedite joined David, mighty men of valor, men trained for battle who could handle shield and spear, whose faces were like the faces of lions and who were as swift as gazelles on the mountain. And look at all these names that were mentioned. Now, here's a question. All these people were the main leaders. You don't have the list of all the foot soldiers. Every name was there because they were main chiefs in David's time. Verse 14. Then the spirit came upon Amasai, chief of the captains. And they say, we are yours, O David. We are on your side, O son of Jesse. Now here is Amasai. Now, here is the question I bring forth to you. Why did those people become chiefs? Because they were independent leaders. They were already leaders in their right. When they came to align themselves with David, David recognized their capability. It is a different capability to be a chief executive officer, than to be a manager, than to be a clerk. You cannot put clerks in CEO position because they will always call on you. Hey, what to do? Eh? Hey, what to do? Hey, what to do? You can't. To each one of us, we must find our right place and sit there. But people who rise up in leadership in mega churches learn independence. They learn how to ally themselves to the one vision, but they learn how to work independently. Verse 12, uh, chapter 12, that is. When, and uh, verse, verse 18, let's finish chapter 12, verse 18. So David received them and made them captains of the troop. There you have it. They became departmental head, captains over David's sub arm. Because the people that they brought were already aligned to them. Verse 23. These were the numbers of the divisions that were equipped for the war and came to David at Hebron to turn over the kingdom of Saul to him according to the word of the Lord. When David was king in Hebron, more people came. Verse 24. Of the children of Judah bearing shield and spear, 6,800. Children of Simeon, mighty men of valor, fit for war, 7,000. 100. Verse 27, Jehoiada, the leader of the Aaronites, with him 3,700. Zadok, a young man, a valiant warrior from his father's house, 22 captains. And as you read on, when, da when David was king in Hebron, he has already lost contact with the people. There was limited contact. He could only contact the people through all the captains and the chief men. Look at David's organizational structure when he grew to become king over all Israel. Chapter 18, verse 14. So David reigned over all Israel and administered judgment and justice to all his people. Joab the son of Zuriah was over the army. Jehoshaphat the son of Ahilud was recorded. Zadok the son of Ahitub and Abimelech the son of Abadah were the priests. Shasha was the scribe. Benaiah the son of Jehoiada was over the Cherethites and the Palatites. And Cherethites and Palatites were like a spe special, uh, what you call it, you call it the special forces. And David's sons were chief ministers at the king's side. Look, there's already a division of structure. So these structures were in place. And all these people are very independent people. 
But for Joab's case, we all learned in earlier lessons, he was a little bit too independent. He began to do things that David didn't tell him to do. He began to make decisions against the main vision. See, David has one vision to build Israel, and uh, Joab began to do things against him, and he threatened his own position. He, in being insecure about his position, he actually made himself uh, uh, put himself in the worst situation of insecurity. But I think that's sufficient to point to the fact of how limited David's contact was with them. So that when Joab went astray, you can see that he still retained Joab, but he had limited contact. And when, when Joab wanted to approach the king, he, oh, he, he, he knew his contact is limited. At some point, he even called him hell. Remember, he called the wise women, etc. And then David knew that... Uh, uh, on restoring his son Absalom and David knew that Joab was behind it. We have to accept that in a mega situation you have limited contact. Principle 34. And to make that limited contact work you need number one independent people. Now the weakness of independent people is they don't know how to work in a group vision but they can be trained. It's almost like a paradox. You need independent people to work dependently. <laughs> but then it can be done if they know where their call is and where their place is in the kingdom of God. Some people get frightened by people who are independent. But they don't understand. You know, some people who are so used to, to everyone marching in line like a soldier. Everyone, about the bar, and then they go on. <laughs> And then they find, hey, somebody else is different. Well, everybody else is marching this way, that guy goes. Who is that guy? Hey, pastor, look, that guy's so independent. Don't worry, he's a musician. <laughs> he could be a singer or something. He's just different. And he needs to be different to be who he is. I mean, you don't want someone to lead song. Let's sing, hung great song, hallelujah. No, it's hung great song, hallelujah. Let's sing, hung great song. No, it's different. You need different personality for different things. So don't be afraid when you see independent people. You need that independence. But, sub point two, you need a group vision. Without a group vision, the independent people will each build their own kingdom. So you need a group vision. Now that will tie up to after the next point, but we look at that. And see it as a little sub point here. See, the group has a vision. And their vision line up behind one man, David. Do you notice that God didn't call gold? God called man. Throughout the Bible, God has never worked through organization. Organizations are tools that men who are called you. God works through people. He calls people. God puts his goals and his desires in human flesh. He doesn't put it on a piece of paper and send it down. He writes it in the heart, in the scrolls of the hearts and minds of men. God's goals come in a form of human flesh. Sometimes the human flesh are not so obedient, that's a sad story. But where they are obedient is a good story. Just like one film director was was uh, trying to make a film about environment. I mean, you could make a film about environment and it look like a lecture. Oh, these are our goals. This is what we want to do with the earth. This is what we want to do with the earth. And because he's a film, film director, he has his talent. So he was talking to this environmentalist and he was saying, Look, don't tell me what you want to do. That's not enough. Don't just tell me the goal. Tell me a story. Give me a story of someone struggling against pollution, against destruction of this earth. Give me a story. Find me a story, a true story. And I'll make that into a film and we'll get the message across. Hello there. The message and the goals God gave us are in story. When Jesus came, he came and told parables. 
Do you know why? Because the realm of the spirit is not analytical alone. It's not dialogismo. The realm of the spirit is visual, emotional, feelable, cognitive, no doubt. But it's everything in more. So you can't separate Moses from the call to deliver Israel. You can't separate David from his call to shepherd Israel. You can't separate Noah from his call to build the ark. Now those men, to function as normal human beings, they will set goals. But behind the goals are persons. God didn't just send us a track called John 3.16. He sent a person. Do you know why? The goals and the desires of God are inexpressible in human language. See, so you can't separate Moses from the call to deliver Israel. You can't separate David from his call to shepherd Israel. You can't separate Noah from his call to build the ark. Now those men, to function as normal human beings, they will set goals. But behind the goals are persons. God didn't just send us a track called John 3.16. He sent a person. Do you know why? The goals and the desires of God are inexpressible in human language. So we don't just line up to a team. The team is a part of it. We line up to a person. Please, meditate further on this truth. Countries become great not because they set goals. Countries become great because the flesh and blood that lead become the personification of the goal. You understand me? Do you know how America can be great again? Give me a personality like Abraham Lincoln or George Washington. And let them become president of the United States. And that country will become great again. They change a president every four years unless he's re-elected again for another four years. Presidents have come and gone in the United States. I don't know what number president is it now. Do you know what number? I don't know. 20-something. Maybe 40-something maybe? 40-something. I think it's 40-something. Presidents have come and gone. The goals and the constitution remain the same. But why is it that sometimes the nation becomes great, sometimes it's not great? It's not the goals. It's the ex- and the personification of the goals in a human personality. Are you hearing me? How does a church or an organization reach greatness if they can find the personification of the goals in human flesh? And it's in the emotion, in the intellect, in the spirit, in the soul, in the body. Hallelujah. And then those goals will reach greatness. Because the story is a story of mankind. And so sometimes people say, Oh, you know, uh, people can change the goals are that. Wait a minute. Agree, people can change. But when people change, people change to people. People don't change to a non-inanimate object. When Moses died, he didn't just leave behind a creed and say, Look, you can do what you want. He left behind a human person called Joshua. What happened to Israel when they have a creed and a constitution and a, and a theocratic written law but without a great personality? You have the story of the book of Judges. Everyone did what is right in his own eyes until someone come who can be the personification of the entire creed. Read the book of Judges. Every time they don't have a flesh and blood leader to personify the goals, they became a, a poor nation, a slave nation. But every time a great man or woman of God rises to become the personification of those goals, the nation rises again in greatness as long as the people come under the umbrella of the vessel that God raises. God, you say, oh, God doesn't depend on people. God uses people. He doesn't depend on one individual. But wait a minute. 
if you imply that he becomes dependent on organization, that is wrong. You say, oh, the vessel can go, the goal of God will, will continue. You're wrong. If the vessels go, God doesn't replace it with the organization. God replaces it with another vessel who is obedient. But you can never run away from the fact that they are vessels. Flesh and blood vessels, clay vessels, like Paul say, we have this urban treasure in. We, we have this, this uh, glory and this special treasure in urban vessels. Hallelujah. That's why we need to align ourselves to whatever call God has brought forth. God personifies his goal while man analyzes the goal. Point number 35. Point 34, limited authority. Another limited authority for you to function properly. A limited contact. A limited contact. And it can be successful through independent leaders and through number two to aligning under the right mentor or the right calling or the right vessel doesn't matter who to me it doesn't matter whoever got to God raised up Kenneth Hagin I will accept and like praise God I will accept his call and I don't mind being identified among the faith sisters I don't mind even people say that that the faith teaching seems to derive from him because we know it didn't, didn't derive from him. God showed us meditation even before we heard of him. But we recognize he's the one whom God raised to bring out the faith message to the world. It's a personality God used. Point 35, which looks like a sub point away in, in uh, point 34 is group vision. But under group vision we have we have clarified that that sub point 34, sub point 2 is more aligning with the right leader. Independent people need to align with the right leader to reach their greatness. Edmund could have been famous and great, but he aligned himself to the wrong leader. So independent people who align to the wrong leadership do not bring about God's purpose. So I, I would specify point 34, sub point 2 as aligning with the right leader. Right? Give that a sub point. So that Point 35 becomes clear. Point 35 is called group vision. Group vision. Now group vision is understanding how to work as a team. See, these points build on one another. Mega church principles. Group vision means like, group vision is point 35. Sub point 1, another point 35. No one can have his own way. When you work with a group, no one can have their own way. Do you know that even the leader cannot have their own way? Let me give you an example. If God called you to do something, and you are the leader, you have to take into account the people you are leading, and sometimes because of them, you may have to slow yourself down. In that way, you are not doing your own thing. In that way, you are giving up something. You know, there are things that, that we could have do, done faster if we, do, if we don't want to make use of, of and let it flow to certain people. Do you know that there is work that if I could do it myself, I could do it very fast. But what's the point? God don't want you to be a hero. God don't want you to be the only one in the world to do everything. God chooses to use as many vessels as possible and so we must know where we are limited. We must know that even though you can do it, you don't want to do it. Now, I love music. I love music. I love worship. I love prayer. I know that if I would spend the time in it and get whatever training that I would necessarily have, I could be a good worship leader. But I must know I cannot divide what I do. I must Hold back. In fact, there's a particular church that uh, I remember that in the early days when we were few under, I remember on the one time I took the guitar and lead the worship at one time when I thought the atmosphere was down. 
but not anymore. And that's a particular church that we are counseling, and the leader and the pastor place base. After being at church, because I was close enough with the pastor, if I'm not close enough with the person, I won't tell him uh, those things. But if I'm close and I really love the person, I'll call the person aside and I say, look, I know you can play bass very well. I know you can play the guitar very well. But I think if you want to pastor, you must let somebody else do the job. Otherwise, you divide yourself on Sunday. Now, if there's nobody to do it, that's fine. But I'm sure if the church grows to be two, three hundred people, you'll find someone. He may not be as good as you. I mean, you may be the best bass player in the world and God called you to the ministry. Does it mean that you travel the world on bass? No. Concentrate on where God calls you to. And do it well. Concentrate on that. And that could be some gifts that God has given you that may not be able to develop on this earth but maybe on the, in, the, on, in heaven. Maybe when you go to heaven and there's no one else to evangelize, no one else to preach the word to, and everyone is redeemed, and everyone are just singing hallelujah, praise the Lord. And then you can join a praise band in heaven and play bass on God's heavenly bass guitar. <laughs> but let's learn where, where God wants to play. So let's learn what group vision. Group vision means that we cannot have what we like to do all the time. Group vision means we cannot have what we want all the time. Isn't it understandable? In fact, some of you discover it the day you got married. And as the story goes, they live happily ever after. But how they live happily ever after is not told to you. Because you found out that you may be a night bird, she may be a day bird. You find out that your schedules change. And you have different personalities. What do you do? You cannot have it your way all the time. Maybe you have the time who like to press the toothpaste. I know Pastor Raj likes to press the toothpaste in the middle. He said that in his sermon. <laughs> so he said, his, the Raj family presses, presses the toothpaste in the middle. <laughs> Hallelujah. That must be a fish grip. <laughs> and then puts it. And I think, if I'm not wrong, his wife, he said his wife presses it from the from the from the back, from the bottom. And so when they got married, they found that it's different. So what, how do you solve the problem? Either you have solution one, have two separate toothpaste, one for pressing in the middle, one for pressing from the back. Or you solve the problem by compromising and saying, it's okay anyway, you want to press it, but just keep pressing it the way you want. Let's share the same toothpaste. I press my toothpaste from the bottom. I like to be systematic. I like to see the bottom all finish. Slowly come to the front and it goes smaller and smaller. Pressing it from the middle makes it look messy. I like to be artistic and in order. So pressing it from the bottom makes it look very nice. Pressing it from the middle looks like a, a new form of modern art. <laughs> and, uh, then I'm the type who likes my toothpaste to be covered properly and put back. That's my personality. <laughs> but maybe you, you could have you could marry somebody who, who is used to taking the toothpaste and using and then using and letting the cover all the place. If you stay with me and you stay in the same house and I find it, I will ask who did that? <laughs> who let the toothpaste cover? On the thing, with the, with the toothpaste without a cover. It's like a church without a pastor. And that's me, I like things to be in order. And, uh, however, I like a little corner where I can be in disorder. Where some of us men are that way. I have one, one place. When I marry my wife, I say, I must have one place that is my bed. I can put it in any way I want. My wife is, in a way, home affairs minister. <laughs> so kitchen, I'll leave her whatever she wants to do. But I have one desk where when I come home, I can just throw my mail there. I can have little bits of paper and messages that people keep passing to me. I put him there, put them there. It looks a mess, but if I want something, I know where it is. Somehow. <laughs> but if somebody else clears it, 
answer is so neat. Everything is straight and neat on my desk. I say, where is that piece of paper? And I say, who touched my desk? No saying it in such a way like God says, who ate of the tree your knowledge of good and evil? Kind of thing. So all of us have different personalities. And when you marry, you find you got to compromise. I come from a family background where the home is a bit messy. But my home is not messy. I mean, I'm neat. Neat enough. And my wife comes from a home that is very, very neat. I mean, her mother would clear everything all the time. When she's free, she'll be sweeping the floor, cleaning some, doing something. And uh, so when we marry, we compromise. They say, look, Let's meet halfway. And, uh, um, and my wife comes from a home where if the children's toys are all over the place, she sees it. <laughs> this is not the way things are supposed to be. Uh, I grew up from a home where little children can just, you know, mess around and all that. And uh, I, I remember going out to my house compound in a government house. And we live in the wooden houses in Johor. And we go out and we play. We are muddy all over. And uh, uh, you know the government houses, they have these stilts, these wooden stilts, and it's like the railway quarters. And uh, I would climb under the, under the house and do my own digging, have my own little place where my little comics are, my little corner. And it's so bad one time that the termites were all over the place. <laughs> but, you know, we, we grew up in that. And I remember I had my little lab that was a little bit messy. Uh, I had my little lab that I built myself, and one day there was an explosion. <laughs> I forgot what caused the explosion, but <laughs> one day there was an explosion. Now, now we have that kind of thing, and uh, it's messy. My mother tends to be on the messy side. Now, I, I'm not exactly like my mother, and I can't stand it. My mother uh, will fill an entire room with junk. I can't stand junk, you know. I can't stand I I may have some... Uh, freedom and chaos, but I can't stand junk. I mean, I, I like to throw things away. That if you don't use, throw it away. If you can't use it, give it away. Or something. Don't, don't, don't keep something that, that you're not going to use. And uh, so, I don't like to keep junk around. You know, for some of us, you may have, you may have one of your spark plugs of your car hiding in a corner that you hopefully one day you can clean it and repair and use it again. <laughs> I would, I would just throw the spark plug away. And uh, when you need it again, get a new one. <laughs> and uh, so my, my mother is the very opposite. Thank God uh, I'm not like that. I mean, that she, she, she's not, she has her own apart flat and then she has a house. And she has a house that is in one room all filled with junk. You won't believe it is, it is, uh, what illustration can I give? <laughs> it is like when you enter in, like it belongs to someone who sells old newspaper. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's it. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And so we compromise and uh, so I say, look, uh, I say, give a little allowance of messiness beyond that point we won't uh, um, permit. So we compromise somewhere. So like I say, if the children mess up a bit, if every day you clear, the next day they're going to dirty again. So I say, give room for a little bit. Go beyond that point they have to learn. So there is a compromise in marriage. Then what happens when you work with people together, two or three people work together? You find that that guy may want this now. Another guy may say, wait. Who knows, you may have a committee. And in that committee, you have someone who's like a horse. I mean, all the time they're running. Come on, pastor. We are not too slow. Come on. Come on, Pastor. It looks like they have been on Empire Echo for too long. Empire Echo? Is that a horse race? Yeah, there is. <laughs> okay. I mean, I mean, I don't know where they get that horse feeling from. <laughs> and uh, so they always say, and every little thing, every slight delay, they say, hey, we're backslided. No. God will judge us. Judgment is coming. Better keep moving. We're too slow. Better for the Holy Ghost. <laughs> then you know this, the last day, hour. <laughs> then you got another guy who's so slow. That he has only two gears, first and second. That other, that other guy only got two gears, fourth and fifth. 
You got all five years first to first to fifth. Imagine that guy, isn't he? Got, he only know how to go fourth and fifth gear. And every time he goes on driving test, he frightens all the driving driving testers. Uh, we had one we had one brother in the Lord, and he went for a test. He said, "How did your test go?" And I, and uh, there's not anybody here. Somebody in tonight. And uh, so he just he's gonna talk about me now. And uh, so. And I said, how do you do it in the test? And he said, my driving tester was, was afraid all the time. He said, why? What's wrong? He said, I thought that every time you start driving a car, you must quickly get on fifth gear. <laughs> Poor driving tester. One of the things that we feel great compassion for is for those who are teaching others to learn how to drive. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And uh, so they are found with only fourth and fifth gear. Then the other guy they go first and second gear. Every week they are the same. And uh, and uh, while the other guy says faster, 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 think, think, uh, think, things are too slow now. I mean, if you, if you do too slow, uh, no, we die. <laughs> Why sit we here till we die? You won't get be scriptural by quoting from the book of Kings. <laughs> and the other person will say, "Don't get in the flesh. Have we pray four hours on this?" Let's fast 21 days before we move. Pastor, anything that we don't fast 21 days is not of the Lord. And uh, for any decision about $10,000, 40 days fast. <laughs> Pastor, for a project of $1 million, I think get the whole church to fast for 100 days. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So you may have someone who only take that slow motion. <laughs> and uh, you look at them, and they're still almost in the same spot. Why? They are, they are, they are go walking by their toes. <laughs> Praise God. So, so slow. And you have to be somewhere in the middle. Remember I talked about the law of average. And when you begin to try to have more and more people, some moving only on first gear, some first, second gear, and some on the fourth, fifth gear, and you know what, as a leader, what fear is to operate, do you know that you can never please everybody? Have you gone into a car... And if you learn how to drive, do you know when all of us drive cars, you've got your personal speed? Your cruising speed, I call it. If everything is clear, you've got your cruising speed. And if your cru- cruising speed is about 80 km, kilometers per hour, you get into someone's cruising speed who is 110. What do you feel? Uncomfortable. And... And if, if your style is to brake very early and slowly glide the car behind the other car, well, the other person's style is to go near, near and then brake. <laughs> <laughs> there is no doubt that you will be uncomfortable in that car. So when you have a big group of people, everyone has their own cruising speed. How do you lead someone to travel at 50 kilometers per hour, someone to travel at 120 kilometers per hour, someone to travel at 100 kilometers per hour, uh, an hour, and everyone has their own comfort zone. And that's why when we meet together, and when we have a group of leaders meeting, I will always remind them and say, look, we all are not little boys. We are all not little girls. We are all leaders. And as leaders, we know how to give and take. And one of the key things is that we cannot all have our own way. How can you drive a car at, a, at all the different speeds at the same time? Impossible. Impossible. And whatever speed you travel at cruising speed as you move in that direction, somebody is bound to be uncomfortable. Somebody is bound to be uncomfortable. And so under group vision, point 35, sub point 1 is no one can have their own way. Everyone has to give and take. If you have leaders who don't know how to give and take, they just need more time to make sure. And please, if leaders begin to come and say, God says the Lord, I always tell them, look, if you say that says a lot, in my position, I can also challenge and say that says a lot. But I make sure enough to say that in some things, we don't want to use that says a lot to challenge each other. That says a lot is not used for thought fighting. 
That says a lot. The other person said, that says a lot. <laughs> what are you going to do? Two person saying that says a lot opposite each other. <laughs> if they confirm each other, then we all can say that says a lot. <laughs> but many times it's opposing. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? I don't want is a false prophet and should be crucified. <laughs> Or, they both may be having a wrong perspective. And they may be seeing the same thing, but they don't have the whole picture. Which is most of the case. That's why they need to be led. Turn with me to the book of Acts. Ooh, praise the Lord. You know, time has flown. <laughs> the book of Acts. Chapter 15. I just give all the principles. They are there in verse 36, 37. Acts 15, verse 36, 37. Then after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, Let us now go back and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Now Barnabas was determined to take with them John called Mark, but Paul insisted that they should not take with them the one who had departed from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the world. Then the contention became so sharp that they departed from one another. So Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus but Paul chose Silas and departed, being commanded by the brethren to the grace of God. Some point one is everyone cannot have his own way. If everyone had their own way, you have things happening like this thing here. You will have a division. So everyone cannot have their own way if they want to work as a group. You learn that as you, as you grow along. Point two, sub point two, is what I call... Timing. Timing. If someone will go at 50 kilometers per hour, someone will go at 120 kilometers per hour, and uh, you want to average at 80 kilometers per hour, what do you do? You drive to all those places. You will drive to, uh, and you may, and, and let's say from, you know, from A, point A to point B, everyone will want to have their own way. You could have take one route and reach there faster the New Grand Valley Expressway. Go all the way 120 except on certain points with AD and reach your goal very fast. Or you could go all the way along housing estate, go in and out, in and out, 50 kilometers per hour at a slow pace and still reach the goal. So what do you do? You may have your own favorite route, but in order for everybody to be a little bit happy, as you are going to some section, you will go into the housing estate uh, and you look over at a person who, who likes 50 km and say, You like it? Nice, eh? Nice! Yes, yeah, this is the way I love it, brother! Nice! Are you alright now? Yes, I'm alright. Are you okay now? Okay. Now, can we go and please the other guy now? Okay, now. And get on the highway. Boom! 1 and 20. Now, the guy at 50 cannot make noise because you have already done what he wants. Then you look over at 50 km and say, Okay, you got your part. Now you look over at the 120 km guy and say, Are you alright? <coughs> Fine. Oh, I love it, brother. This is the way it should have been. <laughs> and you go for some time. And then you come out of the toll gate. And then you go to the 80 km section and say, Now this is what I like, folks. <laughs> and everybody have their little part. Everybody give and take. And in the end, the whole journey is like a zigzag. Then you look over at 50 km and say, Okay, you got your part. Now you look over at the 120 km guy and say, Are you alright? <coughs> Fine. Oh, I love it, brother. This is the way it should have been. <laughs> and you go for some time. And then you come out of the toll gate. And then you go to the 80 km section and say, Now this is what I like, folks. <laughs> and Everybody have their little part. Everybody give and take. And in the end, the whole journey is like a zigzag. Sometimes, when you do something as a group, the path is not the broad way. It's a little zigzag so that you can keep everybody. Hello there. Do you know that if I want to do something God called me to do and I don't intend to keep anybody, I say leave it or take it or leave it, I would do it very fast. But I may leave a lot of people behind. 
But in order to encompass what I call the law of average and the maximum of people so that you don't lose people who are sincere, who really love God. And there will be people who will always defer and in the end will go their own way. But you go by the law of average and uh, you go by what you, what you sense, which you can lead the whole group. Caleb and Joshua type would have to wait for the other little children to grow up, etc. You go at a certain pace in the end, when you reach the goal, most of the people would be there. And you have succeeded in what I call leading the people. Leading is leading. Leading is not just doing. Leading includes doing. But doing without leading is possible. Is it? I could do everything myself. Shoot the carpet, wake him everything, put everything to my standard, everything, and nobody else is doing it. But leading means to give a chance for everybody to do it. Now, let's put it this way. Do you know that if God is so, so urgent about winning the world for Jesus, He would have kept all the men of God alive until now. Hello there. I mean, all he has to give me Wiggles work is another 40 years. Give John, John G. Lee another 40 years. And give all those great men of God who could touch millions of people. And if you got a whole bunch of them, the world today will be shaking. But why did he take them home at their prime? Because they completed their job. And God wants somebody else to complete the other job so that he has a chance to bless the other person. God is interested in blessing us at the same time as getting the job done. That's the good news. And we leaders must be interested in getting the people blessed as the job gets done. Some people are job orientated. They're not people orientated. They're so job orientated, they don't mind hurting people to get the job done. I'm not that way. I don't believe that's the right way. Some people are so people oriented that they forgot how to get the job done. Always, all the time, fellowshipping, fellowshipping, but no job done. We have to strike a balance between the two. You need to strike a balance between the two. You, you, there's no way you can always bring 100% people because they will always bring humans a certain percentage that lie behind. And you have to see the law of average, which is sub point two determined by timing. The time, if you have enough time factor, you could have a little bit for everybody to grow up. See, growth can only come with time. Plants don't need just water, sunlight, Soil, nutrition, air. Plants need time to grow. If you rush a plant to grow too fast, it may become weak. It may become weak. I had tried to grow some sunflowers, and they grow very nicely from the seed. But when the sunflower has just one flower, the flower was so heavy, the entire plant sank. I look at it and say, what kind of sunflower is this? You almost want to scream, come out! <laughs> but you don't. You know that it's a natural cause. Somehow that species, or either that, or your soil condition, or something, is wrong. So that that sunflower, the moment it has one flower, it sank. Then you are looking at a beautiful sunflower lying on the grass. It literally did. I tried to be a gardener and that was it. I never grew that sunflower again. <laughs> Didn't meet the standard. A plant that doesn't have enough time. What was wrong? It didn't have enough time to strengthen the stem. Maybe my proportion was wrong. Maybe my fertilizer was too fast for the flowers. And you know nowadays you got fertilizer that makes it flower. And maybe if I had put more for their stems and leaves. <clears throat> and even though I don't see the flowers here, I must be patient. Never mind, never mind, let the leaves come. And uh, we have bougainvillea and, and all you have to do is put the, one, the red fertilizer and the flowers will come. And, and one time I learned, I learned five principles while doing gardening. Uh, maybe one day I'll share the garden sermon. But one of those things is, when one day I, I over trim it and it looks bottom, and uh, I 
And I say, hey, is it going to die? And I realized that there's not enough fertilizer. And uh, then my wife would say, hey, have you put a flowering fertilizer yet? I look at it and say, no, I think now it leaves a leaf fertilizer. <laughs> and uh, my wife loves the flowers, but I like the leaves and the flowers. So I say, look, if the plant has all flowers and no leaves, it has no place to produce food. So let me give you a bit of leaves and all that. And then, and then after that, when there's enough leaves, you give one shot all the flowering fertilizer, and boom, the flowers come, and it's strong and nice. So it's timing. You need to have the stems and the leaves growing first. And then you throw in the flowering fertilizer, and now it comes nicely. You put it too fast, it's premature. Premature. And I remember when I planted morning glory, my morning glory was only six inches tall and it had a little flower. Guess what? It never grew anymore. <laughs> Look at it, what's wrong with you? <laughs> six inches tall start flowering. I think you're premature. You must have that sickness that they call uh, uh, early old age. <laughs> Hannah, I replaced that plant in the end with something else. Oh, no. It's important to give time. Without enough time, there are some things, some of our leaves, some of our branches need to mature before the flowering and fruiting stage. And everyone, when you work together, have a different growth cycle. Some of us grow faster than, than others. And for me, I'm, I'm the type who, if I do anything, it can be new to me. You give me a few years, I, I will try to reach expert on that. I, I, I like to put my heart into it. I learn fast. One of the things I learn is learn to be teachable and learn fast. I ask questions all the time to learn something new. And uh, we all have a different state of growth. And we need to go with everyone to give them time to grow. And if we are patient enough, most of us will go to the point where we understand and when we can flow along. So time is a key factor. You see, at first Paul did not accept much. But in the book of 2 Timothy, his last epistle, he said, Mark is a blessing to me. The Mark whom he earlier rejected was now a blessing to his life. It took Paul many years to come to the point to be able to accept Mark back. It took a Barnabas to follow up Mark. And in the end, it all worked together because Mark became the strong young man that he should have been. Maybe at his level, he should have mentored under Barnabas before he mentored under Saul. Do you know all of us need to choose our mentors carefully? So if you mentor too fast under someone who is very high, you can never catch up. You get frustrated. So you mentor under somebody who can teach you those things. Then afterwards, you, you, you let go and you mentor higher, into a higher rank. Which is why we used to tell people, if you want your children to learn music, you have to put under three types of teachers. The first time when your child learns music, don't put it under a teacher that is very strict. Because that teacher will not inspire love for music. I mean, in, in primary school, we have to learn Chinese, Mandarin. And uh, my encounter with a Chinese teacher was a bad encounter. I mean, the teacher would say, Okay, ma, ma, ma is hot. You don't know it. You know the right ma, not, don't know the right ma. Whack! I hated Chinese. <laughs> because of him, I never learned Chinese. Didn't want to learn Mandarin. There was his ma business doing. <laughs> All I can remember is not the ma business. I can remember his fierce face and his cane. I only picked up a little bit of Mandarin when, when I saw my wife in a Chinese stream. And the only way I could reach her was to learn Mandarin. I learned enough Mandarin to write what I need. Okay. So the inspiration is important. Number one is inspiration. So the first teacher you put your child under is to create that love for music. Now, some, some teachers could create a love for music and at the same time be professional, bring them professional. But those teachers are very rare. Those will be what I call the genius level. But some who could create them cannot bring them higher. So then you change the next teacher when they are quite good and they love the music. You change to a teacher who is very good but very strict. 
very strict. He, he brings in the strictness to get the discipline. Because in every talent and gift, we need discipline. No matter how talented you are, you need discipline. So that second teacher produces the discipline. But you must bring the teacher at the right time. You cannot go by the age. You have to see whether the child loves the music enough. If the child don't love it yet, you cannot bring the teacher in. But by the time the child's love is established and instilled, then the discipline comes. When the discipline comes, they take it well because they love it. See, when you love something, you don't mind the discipline to get it. And then, when your child is very, 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 very good, you go to a third teacher, the genius side. The one that can give them the coup grace. The finishing touch. The expertise. The, the, the third teacher is called a gifted teacher. The one who gives them that, that finance that they can never have in any other way. And that will bring them into that class above the average. So all of us have our growth span. And in our growth span, we sometimes need different mentoring. Mark at that time needs someone like Barnabas. Maybe Mark was not a very disciplined person. Paul was a disciplined person. Barnabas tend to be an easygoing guy. So Mark sat under Barnabas' ministry for some time. But Mark was called to a higher calling than Barnabas. I know. And he needs to link up with somebody else who is more disciplined. In the end, thank God, he linked up with, with Paul and his ministry go on. So during different places of our life, we need different mentoring. And uh, it's very, very hard to straight away hit a mentor who can bring you to all three levels. Those would be the very highly gifted ones who can. But not all of us have opportunity to straight away mentor under things like that. But we need to learn how to mentor step by step through. Praise God. So there's a second point on time and mentoring. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercy on our lives. We ask, O oh God, as we learn these principles and as we learn to flow as a church and flow as a group, Lord, we realize that you have chosen a great church. A great church, Lord. Not just our church, but the church in the world is a great church, Lord. The church and the bride that you have chosen out of the redeemed mankind is a great church. You call us to be a part of the bride of Jesus. Help us all, Lord, to rise up to the standards that you set, to the patience and long-suffering that you have, O oh God. Father, we thank you for your call, your vision for our lives. We ask, God, that you would inspire each one of us to do great things for you. Lord, we may be small people, and we may consider ourselves one drop in a bucket or in an ocean. But if every one of us will do our little part in the will of God, the whole church in this planet earth will rise up to greatness, Lord, in you. And this world will be changed for you. So help us, Lord, to find our destiny, Lord, to fulfill. In Jesus' name, Amen. Let's rise and sing that song, I Have a Destiny. I have a destiny I know I shall fulfill. I have a destiny enough to be on a hill. I have a destiny. It's not an empty wish, for I know I was born for such a time as this. Give Jesus a good clap offering and God bless you.